Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's good to see you. I mean, October weather's been pretty good so far. It's not too cold. Sun's out. Nice day to gather together, praise, worship the Lord. Let's start with a, a psalm, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. I know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Lord, we thank you this morning that we can come here and gather together, that we can come before you in your presence, Lord, and, and sing your praises to glorify your name, Lord. Help that to be our heart this morning, Lord, that we would forget about the cares of this world, that we would focus on you and you alone, your goodness, your love, your mercy that you have towards us this morning, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we just thank you for all the things you have done for us throughout the week, Lord, the things we can recognize and see, the things we don't even know, Lord. We are thankful. Lord, just be with us this morning. Speak to our hearts, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's uh, stand and worship this morning. We're going to sing, praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer.
to sing God is for us. We're going to start with the chorus. Sing with joy now. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? We won't feel the battle. you a new song just taken from Psalm 34 where it says magnify the Lord with me come exalt his name together so we'll sing that chorus again to remind you of how it goes if you were here and then uh, we'll sing it again it goes, magnify
this morning, Lord, that there is no lack in your person or in your presence. And we thank you that you're a God that's worthy of all our praise. We praise your name. Amen. 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 You may be seated as we have our reading. Good morning. It's good to be here. <laughs> and it's good to be able to read the Lord, so bless you all. Right, so I'm reading from John, chapter 8, verses 21 to 36. <clears throat> and Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees following his statement, I am the light of the world. Then Jesus said to him, said to them, I am going away and you will seek me but will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, you are from beneath and I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. And they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who has sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And he spoke these words, and many believed him. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and continue to worship. Uh, we're going to sing another song by um, a great hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. We've already sung one of her hymns this morning, Praise Him, Praise Him. Uh, we're going to sing, He Hideth My Soul in the Cleft of the Rock. Uh, you know, Fanny Crosby, she wrote over 9,000 hymns uh, during the Curse of Elizabeth. She wrote so many hymns, in fact, that she had to use um, pen names in the hymnals because she didn't want the hymnals to be just full of Fanny J. Crosby. Um, but uh, there's a story of, of her that one time a well-meaning preacher said, uh, oh, you know, it's a shame um, that God did not give you sight when he gave you all these wonderful musical gifts because she'd been blind since she was six weeks old. Um, she'd been blind. She hadn't been born blind, but she was blind from when she was six weeks old. And her response, she said, do you know that if I was able to make one petition, it was that I would have been blind from birth, because then the first thing I would have seen would have been the, would have been the face of my Savior. Um, and that's, that was her testimony, and uh, we're just going to sing one of her songs this morning, and it starts, A Wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. Yes, 
my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me song speak O lord as we come to you and as we move into a time of hearing the word may this be a prayer from each of our hearts that god would speak to us from his word this morning
We just pray this morning, Lord, that you would build us up, Lord, in the faith, in you, in your word, Lord. We pray that we will not be the same when we leave this place as we were when we came in. We pray that you'll do a work in our hearts as we listen to the teaching of your word this morning, from the youngest to the oldest, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Just a few announcements this morning. Um, please remember, we have a bulletin on the back desk there if you want to refresh yourselves, what's happening in the week. But I'll just go through them quickly now. Uh, so Tuesdays, we have our little lights group and coffee morning here at the church from 9.30, little lights and coffee morning at 10. Uh, we have our Wednesday home group on Zoom. So if you're interested in joining that, please speak to Steve and he'll give you the information. And our in-person house groups, Thursdays, um, home group A is at me and Victoria's house, and uh, home group B is at Robert and Rosemary's house, and that's from 7.30. And um, please remember, we are doing the Christmas shoebox appeal, uh, as announced last week. Um, so if you are interested, and um, you know it's a really good cause and an opportunity to... Um, share the love of Christ and the message of the gospel to, to kids all around the world. So um, if you're interested, please see a member of the youth group, uh, Austin, Bessie, uh, Rebecca, Raquel, Talifa, Caitlin, um, and, and there's loads of others. So <laughs> if they're about this high, talk to them. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they'll give you a box and any information you need for it. Um, yeah, so why don't we um, just pray for the kids and the youth and they can go out to their classes. Lord God, we love you and we thank you for, um, we thank you just for kids, Lord. Um, I remember back to a time in, in this church specifically, Lord, the, there was no youth, there was no kids. And, and now, Lord, just a, a testimony of your faithfulness and your goodness, Lord, we, we have loads. And um, we do pray for them this morning that you would uh, speak to their hearts, that you would reveal yourself to them this morning. We pray for the teachers, Lord, that you would just enable them in your spirit, fill them and, and work through them to just to share yourself to, to others, Lord. Um, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'll invite Steve up to, to give us the word this morning. Well, good morning. It's uh, lovely to see you all uh, this morning. It's a beautiful morning uh, outside. Um, before we get into the Word uh, together, there are quite a number in our fellowship that have been sick and unwell over the last uh, week or so. Um, uh, Philip's not here because he's uh, under the weather. And, um, and I want to particularly pray for our, our sister Rose uh, this morning because uh, she's just tested positive for COVID. She has a high fever. She's not doing very well at the moment. So, uh, so we're just going to pray uh, for Rose, um, that the Lord would be with her and the Lord would touch her, uh, and for those as well that are, uh, are not here due to uh, sickness as well. So uh, let us just uh, take a moment to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your mercy and for your love. And Lord, this morning we remember uh, those among us who are unwell, who are battling uh, sickness, Lord, and we ask that you uh, would make yourself uh, known in a very real way to them, to comfort them, to strengthen them, to encourage them at this time, that you would bring strength uh, and healing uh, to their physical bodies. Uh, and for the, Father, we specifically pray for our dear sister Rose this morning, uh, who, who is struggling with COVID. Lord, we just pray in the power of your spirit that you would strengthen her uh, and bring healing to her, that you would comfort her, that she would know your presence uh, with her. And for Alan as well, Lord, as he uh, helps and supports Rose through this time, Lord, we pray uh, comfort and strength for him as well. And so, Father, we thank you that we can commend our dear brothers and sisters into your loving hands. Uh, and, Lord, we ask your blessing upon them all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, this morning we are continuing our verse-by-verse -verse study through Paul's letter to the Colossians. And so if you have your Bible, please open with me to Colossians chapter 3. Now, the subject of the passage we have been considering over the last few weeks is living a Christ-like life. When a person comes to save in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says they become a new creation, that all things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. When a person comes to save in faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says they are justified. That is to say, they are declared to be righteous before God, not in their own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. The Bible declares that they have been forgiven. That is the cancelling of a debt. We were all debtors on account of our sin before God, but in Christ we receive full and complete forgiveness. The debt is cancelled. Uh, in Christ we are also redeemed. That is to say we were slaves to sin, but now we have been set free from sin in Christ. The Bible also says in Christ that we are adopted. Adopted into his family. We were formerly enemies of God in our sin, uh, but now in Christ we are adopted into his family. He is our father. We are his children and together we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and so there are all these great many blessings that are ours in Christ. Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we stand righteous before God in terms of our position. Uh, but now, that being said, it is God's will and purpose for each and every one of us that we be righteous in practice, that we live out the life of Christ each and every day in our lives. And this, of course, is one of the main themes of the New Testament. And the Bible speaks of this using uh, many different terms. Um, discipleship, 
uh, following Jesus. It's the idea of doing what Jesus does and going where Jesus goes. The Bible speaks of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity, the, the process of becoming more like Christ. The Bible speaks of sanctification, the process of becoming holy or more like Christ. The Bible tells us to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. All these different terms that are really all communicating uh, different um, different aspects of the same basic thing that God wants us uh, to be like Christ. And this is uh, very much the biblical goal of all Christian ministry, that we would become like Christ. It's the goal of the Christian life. And, and this, of course, really is a work of the Spirit of God in us. As we feed upon the Word of God and as the Holy Spirit of God uh, takes that word and, and, and makes it a, a part of our lives. Um, it's very much a, a work of the Spirit of God, but it's a work of the Spirit that we have to yield to. It's a work of the Spirit that we have to uh, live out, both in the life of the church uh, and in the world. Now, of course, it's true that we will never be perfectly like Christ in this life. Uh, one day we will be perfectly like Christ because the Bible says when we get to heaven we will see him and when we see him uh, we will be like him. Uh, but until then, by his spirit and through his word, God is working in us to make us more like Christ uh, and we are called to yield to that work of God. And this is really the process that the Apostle Paul is speaking of here in Colossians chapter 3, which of course is a chapter uh, all about practical Christian living. Uh, and here in Colossians chapter 3, Paul uses the language of clothing as a metaphor for the Christian life. He uses this language of, of putting on clothes and uh, putting off clothes to illustrate what a Christ-like life looks like in practice. He basically says, now we are new creations in Christ. The old clothes that we used to wear no longer are appropriate for us. We need to throw those clothes away and we need to put on new clothes. The old clothes are our life of, of sin uh, and Paul listed many of those sins in, in verses 5 uh, through 9 of chapter 3, uh, but the new life is the life of Christ. And he lists the, the virtues of Christ or the characteristics of Christ uh, in verses 12 through 14. And so because we are new creations in Christ, because we have been changed inwardly, we are now to live a changed life outwardly. Our life outwardly in practice is to reflect the reality of who we are inwardly in Christ. Uh, and so, as we work our way through these verses, we're very much taking our time because um, uh, the teaching here is very practical and it's very helpful for us and it's well worth us uh, taking the time to uh, consider uh, these things carefully. Last week, we looked at verse 12 and we introduced uh, the passage, and we looked at the first two virtues or first two characteristics of uh, a Christ-like life. Uh, Paul said, put on tender mercies and put on kindness. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue on through uh, this list as Paul now speaks of more uh, virtues, uh, more characteristics of Christ that we are to put on in the Christian life. And so, uh, let us just read verses 12 through uh, 14, uh, and then we'll uh, dive back into uh, the text. And so, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. 
And Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Uh, we pray by your spirit that you would speak into our hearts, that you would speak into our lives. Uh, Lord, it is our desire this morning to become more and more like Jesus. Uh, and as we study in this passage about what that Christ-like life looks like, Father, I pray that you would teach us, work in us, and work through us this wonderful life of Christ. And so we commit our time to you now this morning as we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, and so here in verses 12 and 13, uh, we have seven characteristics of a Christ-like life. Seven characteristics of the new man in Christ, as Paul puts it. Uh, five of them are listed there in verse 12, and those five are tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Uh, and they collectively are what might, we might refer to as, as Christ-like attitudes. Uh, then in verse 13, uh, we have two Christ-like actions, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Uh, and the idea here that Paul is saying is that if we have these five Christ-like attitudes, they will manifest themselves in these two Christ-like actions. And last week then, we looked at tender mercies and we looked at kindness. Now, as we, as we get back into these um, characteristics, uh, just, just a few reminders. We went through this in a bit of detail last week. Uh, but, but just to remind you that all of these uh, qualities, all of these characteristics, that they really are all relational. They are all seen in the context of relationships. Uh, and so uh, this is very practical uh, and, and, it's, and it's very real. It's also worth uh, noting and reminding ourselves that uh, we are all different. And there is some room within these characteristics for different people to express them in different ways. And we have different personalities and, and, and different you know, kinds of people in, in various ways. And so, um, and so while the, these characteristics are all um, are quite clearly defined, the, the application of them can look different in different people at different times. Uh, and, and we need to sort of be aware of that. Um, and, and finally, as, as we've uh, already mentioned, is, is that all of these characteristics are, of course, modeled upon the life of Christ. Uh, the life of Christ is really the ultimate example and expression of all of these uh, characteristics, and, and we'll see that, and we have seen that as we work our way uh, through them. Uh, and so the first one, then, was tender mercies, or uh, compassion. And it was a word, um, you might recall last week, that, that translates uh, literally bowels of compassion. And it's an interesting way of uh, speaking about it, but uh, in, in the sort of the Hebrew uh, mind, uh, they sort of describe things in a very physical way. Um, when they were moved with compassion for somebody, you know, they, they would feel it inwardly and they'd feel it in here. And so they'd refer to it as, as the bowels of, of compassion. Uh, but, but Paul is, is saying that, that we should be compassionate towards others. It is a Christ-like characteristic to be compassionate, compassionate towards others. That is to be sensitive to the needs of others, to be touched inwardly by the needs of others, to be moved to help uh, somebody in difficulty or somebody in need. Uh, Jesus exemplified that many times, and he taught about that many times, as we looked at last week. Uh, the second characteristic is, uh, is kindness. Uh, it could also be translated goodness or uprightness or, uh, or excellence. And, uh, of course, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to be kind? But at the heart of the word, uh, it carries this idea of meeting the needs of others. We are truly kind when we are meeting the need of of somebody else, and that could be in, in small little ways, it could be in uh, bigger uh, ways. Uh, and, and of course, God is kind. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's knowing and understanding and experiencing the kindness of God that brings about spiritual growth uh, in our lives, and we looked uh, about that uh, last uh, week. Uh, and so by being kind to one another, we are very much um, a bearing witness to, to, the, to the character and the nature 
of, of God, and, and that kindness can lead people to repentance and spiritual growth. And so that brings us to the third in the list, and that is humility. Humility there in verse 12. Now, the word humility, it's a very important uh, word in the Bible, and it's a word that, that really means lowliness of mind. Lowliness of mind. Perhaps the, the simplest way to understand humility is that it is the opposite of pride. Uh, a prideful person exalts himself. A truly humble person exalts God. And that's the difference in a nutshell. Now, to, to, to present humility as a, um, as a virtue uh, was something in Paul's day that would have been very shocking to those who were um, uh, sort of embedded in, in the Greek way of thinking. Because in, in the Greek culture of Paul's day, they, they didn't see humility as a good thing to be desired. They associated humility with, with servitude and, and with cowardice. Uh, humility wasn't a strength uh, that we were to seek after, but it was really a weakness that, that we should avoid. Uh, and so the fact that um, uh, both in, in the life and example of Jesus and indeed in the teaching of Paul, that humility is regarded as a virtue uh, was something that really uh, flew against the, the whole um, secular way of thinking back in Paul's day. Humility was not a reason to look at, uh, towards somebody, you know, with, with uh, respect. It was a reason to, to look down on somebody, you know, with, with disgust. And, um, and, and I think it's probably the case today that, that humility, in, in the, the true sense of the word, is, is, is just as unpopular today as it was back then. Now, there really isn't a lot of genuine humility about, um, and certainly not the kind of humility that is spoken about in the New Testament. Uh, there is, of course, quite a lot of false humility uh, around, public displays of humility which satisfy the pride of man, and it's, uh, of course, one of the great ironies that uh, oftentimes a great public display of humility is, is in reality often an expression of, of pride. Uh, but humility is a fundamental uh, characteristic of the Christ-like life. And so what does humility look like uh, in practice? Uh, well, of course, we have to start with Jesus. Uh, Jesus himself is presented to us in the New Testament as the supreme example of humility. Humility. In fact, the call to humility for all believers is based upon his supreme act of humility, which is explained to us in Philippians chapter 2, in that Jesus firstly took on human form in the incarnation. God became man. And not only that, Jesus then took upon himself the death of the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. In Philippians chapter 2, I'll just read these verses to you about Jesus. It says, Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Literally, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus emptied himself in coming from heaven to earth, and he humbled himself in going from the earth to the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Uh, and so Jesus is supreme uh, example of humility and his supreme act of humility uh, forms then the basis for the command to us to walk in humility. Uh, and so how does this then play out practically in our lives? Well, you know, it's, it's often been said that if you think you're humble, you're not. You ever heard that? If you think you're humble, you're not. Now, um, I, I kind of get the idea and, you know, it kind of, you know, it's got a ring of truth to it. 
Um, but but it, it's not really true. Uh, and, and the reason it's not really true is that it is possible, at least according to the New Testament, to be humble and to know you're being humble. Jesus said he was humble. Uh, Paul actually said he was humble. Moses in the Old Testament said he was humble. In fact, if we are commanded to be humble, then we have to be able to recognize when we are being humble. Otherwise, we don't know if we're obeying the command. And so it is possible to be humble and to know that you're being humble without being prideful. And you think, well, well, how, how does that kind of uh, work out? Well, what it means is that we need to be constantly and continually evaluating our lives and our lives in general and the things that we do in particular in light of Scripture, in light of what the Scripture teaches about humility. And I want to give you three uh, scriptures, and if you take your notes, you can write these down, which explain to us what humility looks like in practice. And we can use these scriptures, and we could refer to many others as well, but we can use these scriptures to honestly examine our own lives in general and our specific actions in particular to see if we are indeed being humble or not. And so the first scripture is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And the first point about humility is this, is that the, the humble person, the truly humble person, recognizes that they are fully dependent upon Christ. Okay, the truly humble person recognizes that they are fully dependent upon Christ. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 it's the famous passage about his thorn in the flesh. And the thorn in the flesh, uh, whatever it was, uh, made Paul's life very difficult. And he prayed that the Lord would take it away. He prayed three times that the Lord would take it away. But the Lord did not take it away. The thorn was there by the Lord's will uh, to keep him humble. So Paul said. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, uh, Paul said that, that Jesus said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul then concludes, he says, Well, if that's the case then, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and in needs and in persecutions and in distresses for Christ's sake. Why? Because when I am weak, then I am strong. Because it is in my weakness that Christ's strength is perfected. And so... The humble person, the truly humble person, is the person who recognizes their need for the Lord and recognizes their need for the Lord in everything all of the time. He knows that he is weak and he knows he needs the Lord's strength and so he continually asks God for his help and he continually trusts God to provide in all his circumstances. The humble person firstly recognizes their full dependence upon Christ. And of course, we can take that scripture and we can uh, uh, look at our lives in light of that truth and we can ask ourselves the question, you know, am I in my life and in the specific circumstances of my life, am I fully trusting in the Lord? Am I recognizing my own weakness? Am I recognizing my own inability? Am I recognizing my need for the Lord's strength? And if we look at our lives and we look at certain decisions we've made or certain things that we've been doing and, and, we, and we say, well, actually, no, I haven't been doing that. Then, then we can acknowledge that before God and we say, Lord, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. I've been depending on my own strength. And, 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 and that's pride. And, and Lord, forgive me for my pride. You know, I recognize my need for you. Uh, Lord, I need you in all these circumstances in my life. Lord, can you help me? Lord, please help me. I am weak, and I need your strength. See, that is humility. Uh, the second um, kind of characteristic of humility, if you like, 
that the humble person displays is that the humble person, the truly humble person, doesn't think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And he goes on to speak of the exercising of that faith through serving others, uh, using the gifts, spiritual gifts God has given us for the building up of the body of Christ. Uh, and so the truly humble person, Paul says, has a proper, sober view of himself. Now, what that means is on the one hand, we don't think more highly of ourselves than, than we ought to think. You know, we don't come to church thinking, oh, this church is lucky to have me. Goodness me, where would this church be if it wasn't for me? You know, oh, where would this ministry be if it wasn't for me? Or, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, because the truly humble person recognizes that the ministry doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the Lord. And the church doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the Lord. And the work of building the church really is, is the Lord's work. And I am just an empty vessel through whom the Lord does his work, just like all the other empty vessels through whom the Lord is doing his work. Uh, and so the humble person has a, has a proper view of himself. He doesn't think more highly of himself than he ought to think. But at the same time, we can engage, particularly when it comes to our, our service of others, we can engage in, in, in what really is false humility. Because we think, oh, you know, if something needs to be done, well, you know, I'm not very good at that, you know, so, so no, no, I'm, I'm sort of not going to do it. Now, okay. We can talk about all the different scenarios and this, that, and the other. Uh, but, but there are some times, and, and, I, and I've been there and I, I've done this, um, where I, I don't want to do it because if I do it, I might mess up and I might look bad. And so I'm going to not serve others because I don't want to risk looking foolish. So what's that? Is that humility or is that pride? Right? That is pride. I am thinking of me and putting my needs above those of somebody else. And so, so true humility, it doesn't say, um, you know, okay, oh, oh you know, I'm just going to sit here and, 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 and the Lord's going to do it all. The Lord's going to do it all. I'm, I'm just going to sit over here and just let the Lord do it all. Now, the Lord wants us to be engaged. The Lord wants to use us. The Lord wants to work through us. And when the Lord has gifted us and when the Lord has given us opportunity to serve, the truly humble person will take those opportunities and will serve unto the glory of God, even if it means risking myself looking like a fool, or even if it means me getting something wrong. I mean, every time I have to pick up a guitar and lead worship in a home group because there's nobody else to do it, every time I think to myself, no, I'm not going to do it because I'm, I'm, I can't sing and it's just going to go bad and, you know, I'm going to look bad and, no, let's just not do it. And then I think, okay, no, no, that's not the right way to think. Hold on. Um, okay, yeah, it might not sound great. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll all agree on that one. Uh, but, you know, it's an opportunity for us to worship the Lord together in song. And really, it's not about how good my voice is or not. It, it's about all of us together singing and worshiping together. And, um, and, and that is how we are uh, to be. And so, so the truly humble person recognizes their full dependence upon Christ. The truly humble person doesn't think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. Uh, and, and the third point to, to make here is simply that the truly humble person esteems others better than himself. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 uh, and 4. Right before the Apostle Paul kind of launches into that wonderful declaration uh, of, of the humility of Christ in condescending down to earth and humbling himself to the point of death and even the death on the cross. Uh, Paul uh, says this to the church in Philippi, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so again, this is, uh, a very practical 
uh, thing, a very practical way to, um, to, to demonstrate and, and to, to live out uh, humility in our lives. And it's very simply um, looking out for the interests of others, putting others above ourselves, putting the needs of others above our own. And uh, that is an expression of humility. And again, these things we can examine our own lives in the decisions that we've made, in the things that we do, um, you know, in the, the ministries that we serve in, in the church, you know, in our you know, lives outside of the church in terms of our relationships at work or at school or in wherever it may be, you know, I mean, are, are, you know, is this something that characterizes us? Do we put the interests of others above our own? Um, you know, and that's a very practical thing that we can evaluate decisions that we make um, based upon scripture to see if we are being humble uh, or not. And so, so humility then, uh, it's a supremely Christ-like uh, virtue. We are called uh, to be humble. Like all of these virtues, these are not things that we can do in our own strength. These are things that we need, um, you know, to depend upon the Holy Spirit to produce in us, as, and, and then we need to yield uh, to that um, work. But one final thought on, on humility, which kind of wraps this up and, and really emphasizes why this is so important for us as believers in the life of the church. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, uh, Peter said, Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Why? For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We all need God's grace. God's grace can be explained in many ways. I think in this context, we can understand God's grace as God's help. We all need God's help. Grace is what God does. Grace is what God gives freely. And we all need God's help. And the amazing thing, as we saw in our uh, home group Bible study on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, is, you know, we all need God's help, but God wants to help us. And never forget that. God wants to help you. He wants to help you. But notice he gives grace. He gives his help to the humble. And oftentimes if we're struggling, you know, uh, with something, you know, it is something we need to examine our own hearts. If God resists the proud, am I being prideful in that situation that I need help in? Because that might be the problem. That might be why I'm struggling. Because there's pride in my heart and I'm behaving in a prideful manner. So and when I behave in a prideful manner, I am cutting myself off from God's help. And what I need to do is I need to humble myself. Humble myself in the sight of the Lord. Recognize my own pride. Confess it as sin before the Lord. Turn to God. Ask for his help in humility. And we know, because it's promised in his word, that God gives grace. God gives his help to the humble. God, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And so... Humility is so important. Uh, and we've probably got time for one more uh, here, which is the next one. Meekness. Meekness. Your, if you have a different translation, it might say gentleness. Or you might even have another word. And oh, it's often the case with, with these words is that the, the Greek words that were originally used have, have a, you know, qu a, quite a great depth of meaning and our English language is actually quite superficial in a lot of ways. And so oftentimes it can take many English words to convey the full meaning of a single kind of Greek word. And that's why you get variation in the, in the translations in terms of, um, you know, how um, uh, it's carried over into English. Uh, but the word meekness, it could also be translated gentleness. And this is one of those words that's a difficult concept to uh, to get across in, Engl in English because we don't have a word like this in English. And, and, so, uh, and because of that, the word meek has kind of um, come to mean uh, something in English that it doesn't really mean in, in the Bible. Um, that's kind of illustrated in the, in the statement, uh, meekness is weakness. Have I heard some, someone say that? 
this idea that being meek and, and mild-mannered and being compliant and being a pushover, you know, that kind of thing. Um, now, that's not what this word means uh, at all. But this word is very interesting and quite remarkable because it carries uh, in this one word both the ideas of gel gentleness and strength. Now, you think, okay, they almost seem like they're opposite to each other. So how do they sort of coexist? Um, and and it is, it's quite a wonderful thing. A couple of examples from uh, back in the first century in terms of how this word uh, was used. Um, this word meek, it was used of animals like horses. Horses that were very powerful, but for the most part were very gentle. And, and the idea there is that they had power, but that power was under control. And that power was only used when necessary. And that's kind of the idea. Gentleness, but with strength and power, and that strength and power is under control, and it is used only when necessary. Uh, another use of this word back in Paul's day was of a doctor um, if, if you had a broken bone, you, you broke your arm, and they, they do this today, you know, they'll reset, the, they'll reset the bone, won't they? If it's sort of crooked, they'll, they'll yank it back into place. Um, and, and then, you know, hopefully it will heal, uh, heal correctly. Um, but, but the idea is that the doctor, when he's sort of taking your broken arm and moving it into place, he's got to use some strength to do it. But yet he's also got to be gentle. Because if he does too much, then he's going to make it worse. So he only uses the amount of strength that is necessary to do the job. And that's kind of the idea. Uh, and so, so this idea of meekness, this idea of gentle strength, it's not really about being mild-mannered and a pushover and weak and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's being both gentle and strong when necessary, and that strength being under uh, control. Now, Jesus, of course, again, is our example uh, here. Um, he referred to himself as being meek in a famous scripture in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, when he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So G Jesus refers to himself as, as meek, as, as gentle. Now, what does that look like in practice? And there's probably several examples we could point to in the life of Jesus. But one thing that, that kind of strikes me as, as, a, as a good example of this meekness in the life of Jesus, is, is Jesus' approach to children. Now, Jesus loved the little children during his time here on earth. Um, in Mark chapter 10, uh, people brought little children to Jesus that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Oh, what are you bringing those? Get those children away from Jesus. You know, they're, they're too noisy. They're too rowdy. You know, we, we, don't, we don't want children around here. And what did Jesus do? When Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And then he went on to make the point that assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took the children up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Wonderful. You know, wonderful. And, and a tre tremendous teaching. You know, the disciples were saying, oh, you know, children, they should be seen and not heard. Put them out the back. And then Jesus said, um, actually, you disciples, you actually need to become like them. You're thinking that they need to become like you, but in reality, you need to become a bit more like them. Uh, and so, so, so we see this, this gentleness, this, this tenderness. Um, but then, in, in Matthew's gospel, after Jesus said basically the same thing, he, he then flips to the other side of the coin. Because then he said, Matthew 18, 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones, to believe, little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Ooh. So we've just gone from, you know, meek and mild and blessing the children say anyone who causes one of these little ones to sin you know they will be under severe judgment you see you've got gentleness but you've got strength 
And we see that in the life of Jesus. Whenever Jesus um, was faced with, with, with sinners who were broken hearted, you know, the woman caught in adultery or the woman who had five husbands and, and so on, you, you find that Jesus was very gentle. He was very firm about the sin, but he was very gentle. But then when he was speaking with the Pharisees, those who were teaching what was false, those whose teaching were leading people away from God and leading people to hell, Jesus was very strong in his language towards them. Multiple times he says, woe to you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Just after the passage that Pat read this morning, um, Jesus uh, said to the Pharisees that they were, they were liars and they were children of the devil because the devil was a liar from the beginning. And you see the gentleness, but then when necessary, when it came to confronting sin, when it came to confronting false teaching, we see the strength. Jesus was no pushover. Jesus wasn't weak. But his strength was under control, and he used it only when it was necessary and to the extent that it was necessary. Uh, and so, too, it is to be with us in our relationships uh, with one another and, indeed, in, in the life of the church as well. And so, the next characteristic is, is long-suffering, uh, which we will come to next week. And I have to say that long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, uh, um, it's, it re this is where the rubber really kind of meets the road. This is where it becomes very close to the bone, okay? And so uh, be prepared for that next week uh, as we get to long-suffering and bearing with one another. It's vitally important, vitally important in, in the Christian life and in the life of the church, and we'll come to that next week. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word uh, to us today. Father, we ask that you would bless your word to each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Uh, help us to uh, be compassionate. Help us to be kind toward one another. Help us to be humble before you and in our relationships with others. Lord, and help us to, uh, to express this meekness in our lives, being gentle and tender-hearted with others, but yet being firm and strong. Uh, when it comes to matters of truth and, and sin and unrighteousness. And so, Father, we thank you uh, for your word today. We ask you bless it to all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand uh, together. We'll sing a closing song. Come, ye sinners, poor and needy. say
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 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 May God bless you all. Thank you.